I want you to repeat after this and then tell your neighbor this. Shikamo shy, pass him on by. Moses, hold my coat. Do it. Moses, hold my coat. God bless each and every one of you. Brother David, come on, let's go. Why don't you put your hands together in thanks to what God has done up to this point. Hallelujah. The wonderful thing is it's not even over. Amen, amen, amen. This is just halftime. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We want to welcome everybody, don't we, Cornerstone? Let's welcome our guests here today. If this is your first time here at Cornerstone, welcome to the party, the Holy Ghost party. Amen. But we are glad that you are here. And we just want to put the service on pause just for one moment. We do this every Sunday. We want to just give you time to greet one another. So let's all stand. Amen. And once you slip in the aisle, the band's going to play. And uh, we're just going to take a break. Find someone that you don't know and introduce yourself to them. Praise the Lord. Let's return to our seats. 
Amen. We're going to start service back up. While you're finding your seats, I'd like the ushers to come, get in their places. We're going to prepare to receive God's tithes and our offerings. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. What an exciting morning we are having this day. And as I mentioned, it is not over. God is still moving. Praise the Lord. Amen. Appreciate our ushers getting into their places. Once again, on behalf of our pastor, First Lady, Brother and Sister Mayo, our staff, amen, we want to welcome each and every guest that is here today. Why don't we give them one more round of applause? Because we are so glad that you are here. I got to meet some of these guys in our meet and greet. It's so nice to meet Luke right here and Benjamin. Amen. Let's give them a hand today. Praise the Lord. And there's many other guests. If you are a first-time guest, you should have received one of these guest cards. And if you did not get one, our ushers are holding them up. Please get one during our offering. Hold on to it. And after the preaching and after God is done doing what he always does, touch lives, heal marriages, and all that good stuff, amen. Hang on to that card. Fill it out. Meet us out in the coffee shop area. Our coffee shop will be open following the service. Fill out your guest card. Get in line and order any drink that you want, a, a tea, a latte, Italian soda. And you don't have to pay a thing. All you got to do is just give them your guest card. They know exactly what to do with it. They won't even charge you a dime. And everybody say, I like that. Amen. But uh, we're looking forward to getting to know you a little better. If you have any questions about the church, what's going on around here at Cornerstone, we have lots to tell you. Amen. We're just kicking off revival. You're going to hear more about it. Amen. And uh, we want you to be a part. Praise God. So we look forward to meeting you following the service at the coffee shop. Uh, we do want to remind you also that we are having revival services for the rest of the month every Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Everybody say Sunday, Monday, Tuesday at 7 o'clock, 6.30 for prayer. And uh, Wednesday we're having prayer still, right, Pastor? Do we move prayer to a different day? I did. You're going to talk about that. Well, we are urging and inviting every single person that's here this afternoon to come and join us for prayer starting tomorrow morning at 530 from 530 till noon, both tomorrow and Tuesday. We're asking everybody in Cornerstone, come before you go to work or you get a break or something, the church doors will be open, the front doors at 5.30 in the morning. We are praying for the momentum of revival to continue. If you're visiting with us, we want you to feel very welcome to just come on in, find a place to pray, stay as long as you like, but from 5.30 tomorrow morning until noon, both tomorrow and Tuesday. God bless you. So we will forego our normal Wednesday midweek prayer for those prayer times, okay? But Sunday, Monday, Tuesday's revival, as Pastor mentioned, come on out for a season prayer in the morning. Amen. I think that takes care of all of our announcements. Let's all stand. On Sunday mornings, we march to the front row by row and put in our offering. If you are here today and you didn't come prepared to give, don't feel bad, but please march with us so everybody can get out that came prepared and uh, your toes won't get stepped on. Amen. So let's pray over this offering. Lord Jesus, we praise you today, God. We thank you, Lord God, for your spirit that we are feeling here this morning. We look forward to what you have in store for us through the rest of the service, God. We ask that you would bless this gift, this offering, as we sow back into your kingdom today, Lord, that it go to the furthering of your gospel, that this world may be saved. We pray in Jesus' name and the church say amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord as we give today.
passing through earthly treasures soon will fade but i found my hope in you you are the one i want you are the one i need this world can have it all they can take everything give me jesus give me jesus
everything that had breath. Hallelujah. My, my, what an amazing camp meeting spirit is in this place today. So, so very thankful for the presence of the living God. A little birdie told me that Sister Jamie got the Holy Ghost during song. I think there's a bunch of folks that got really close to receiving the baptism of reality. And now that you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're going to see things on a scale and on a level that intellectualism, ideology, philosophy, any epistemology on terra firma cannot replicate, duplicate, manifest, manufacture. You just can't see this for what it is. Even Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man is born of water and spirit, you cannot see. And so it's an amazing thing to have sight. An amazing thing. Oh, once again, it's already been, it's already been said, but let me echo once again, we are delighted to have our visitors you are just so very, very special to us and to God, and just great to have you. Once again, prayer tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. Pastor, I go to go. I know you got to go to work. You might as well stop here. It's right on the way, and it's worth it to get out of your way for the momentum of revival and special needs, and uh, we know that God is going to meet with us in a special measure in Jesus' name. It is so, so good to have evangelist Brother Jacob Phillips with us. Now, Brother Phillips is a little different, but he's our kind of different. And I leaned over to him a couple minutes ago. I said, this great big metropolitan area here, it's growing faster than you can shake a stick at. And God sends a country boy evangelist from Mississippi all the way up here to Spokane. But he's a little different. Brother Phillips, we're so glad you're here. You're right on time. You're in the Holy Ghost. Cornerstone loves you. You're a man of God. We want you to come and preach. Let's put our hands together under the Lord for the man of God. While you're clapping your hands, why don't you lift your voice and give Jesus another shout of praise. Come on, while you're clapping your hands, make your voice as big as your hand clap is. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, the book of Psalms, chapter 47. And uh, while you're turning there, let me say what an honor and a privilege it is to be with the wonderful saints of God in the Northwest. Look forward to what God is going to do. I believe exactly what uh, Pastor Mayo said a few moments ago. He said, we're going to start here and go higher. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying amen to that today. But let's start here and let's go higher. And I give honor, of course, to Pastor Mayo and his wonderful wife, who are some of Pentecost's best, and they are some of God's very best. When God uh, decided to send a man uh, to, the, to the unbroken Northwest, he sent a man with an attitude that could break it. And I thank God for that. And uh, I just believe that we ain't seen nothing yet. The best is yet to come. And I, I know y'all hear this all the time, so it's just kind of, oh, yeah, that's what you hear. But I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, the best is yet to come. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Amen. This is a very familiar text to most of us. Begins in the title. Now, there, there's some power in the titles of these psalms, and I, I want to talk about them today. It begins to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. And it says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Amen. I just want to preach today from this verse, or from this chapter, rather, about songs from the son, for the sons of Korah. Songs for the sons of Korah. Would you help me right now by lifting your hands to heaven, asking God to move in this house? God, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. Come on, would you help me pray right now? Don't leave me by myself, but let's pray together. God, we need you. We need you to help us. We need you to move in this place. We need you to change us by your word, by your power, by your spirit. God, there's nobody like you, not in heaven, not in the earth. We're asking you, God, right now to have your way in this house. Let your anointing, let your power, let it accelerate through this place. Let it change us. Let your word challenge us. Lord, I pray right now that your spirit would take root in someone's life. God, that you would fill somebody else with the Holy Ghost as you did for our dear sister just a moment ago. I'm asking you, God, right now, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Oh, Jesus, we're believing you today. Come on. Do what the Bible says in our text today. Clap your hands. All ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You may be seated. This portion of Scripture has been the centerpiece of opening remarks for preachers for decades. It has been a button. I'm just going to tell you all it's the truth, whether uh, other preachers will admit it or not. I'll admit it today. It's a button that we push when we're almost there. And so we, we push that button just to kind of help us get over the edge a little bit so that God's people will begin to shout and dance and just go bananas. And so this, this, this portion of Scripture, undoubtedly it's a song that is written to arouse a worshiper, to make one stand up and give God praise. I mean, who wouldn't want to give a God that made the heavens and the earth praise? Who wouldn't want to clap your hands and shout unto that God? The one that said, let there be light, and there was light. That called so many things that we see today, but uh, you have to realize that as this is a prophetic psalm, as this is a psalm that is reaching into the future, and I, Pastor Mayo, I don't know if we'll get to all of it today, but the good thing is we got two more services, so I can preach part two and part three if I need to. But but there, there, this, this psalm is prophetic, but while it is prophetic, it was a psalm written for a literal day, for a literal time, and for a literal moment. And so with that being said, I want you to imagine with me as you walk into the tabernacle as the sons of Korah stand at the door and through the outer courts you can hear the singing, them singing the songs of the Lord. Picture walking into Solomon's temple in all of its wonder of all the gold and the silver and the fine linens. Picture yourself walking up on the porch between the two pillars of brass and the echo of a choir comes from just inside the door and the gatekeepers sing along with the choir. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Whew. It makes you want to do it in this house, but just picture with me what it looked like walking into the house of God of Solomon's temple as the choir is standing there. They were the original choir members that sang this song and they, they began to sing and I can feel in the heat of the moment the overwhelming desire to respond to the words of the song. But let's be honest with ourselves, most of us can't quote another verse out of this chapter. I'm waiting. We quote this verse, but most of us can't quote another verse out of chapter 47. We can quote out of chapter 45. We can quote out of chapter 46. We can quote out of this one verse out of 47, but then we can't really do much with it after that. We can even quote a, a few verses out of chapter 48. But 
Chapter 47 seems to be a place that we get stuck on one verse. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. But verse 7 says that we are to praise God with understanding. So it says clap your hands, but before you get through with the chapter, you are commanded by God to understand what you're clapping about. See, we some clapping fools in the church. We clap about everything. We clap, we clap for announcements. We, I, I'm going to preach here in a minute. My time don't start till I start hollering. We, we clap about everything. We can clap about food. We can clap about fellowship. We clap about if the preacher said something. Sometimes you clap, you don't even know what the preacher said. Don't sit there and look at me like you ain't never done that before. You know good and well, you probably already done it today. What did he say? But Scripture gives us the commandment that while we are clapping, we are to clap with understanding. So as a student and a preacher of the Word of God, my goal is to get you to understand the purpose, the reasoning for clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God for with a voice of triumph. It is not for hype on a Sunday afternoon. It is not something to say in formality. It is not something to say that when you don't know what to say. It is not just something to be spoken to get you to get over the edge, to get you to shout. But this, this is a response coming from a people that had an understanding of where God had brought them from. This text is being written and sung by an unnamed son, uh, by an unnamed son of Korah in compilation with David. The text is written by, uh, to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. These wonderful musicians in the house of God, talented in so many ways, and they had so many jobs in the house of the Lord. They were the original choir directors, and we, we think we're cool when we start all of this call and repeat stuff, but Brother Mayo, that was the sons of Korah that did that because it would be the sons of Korah that would sing, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, and then Israel was to stand and to repeat what, it, what they had sang and when they had sung them words, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. But these men that are folk focal point of the Psalms and a focal point of the house of God. We, we turn to Numbers chapter 16 and it tells us the story of how they became who they were. The story of Korah's rebellion and unfortunately Korah's fall. Korah did not realize their importance to the kingdom of God. The Bible says, and we'll come back to this later, but the Bible says that they were men of renown, an Old Testament term to describe men that were men with power and men with authority, men with might. The Bible says that they were famous in the congregation. And unfortunately, these men made a decision to cross the man of God. They said, Moses, you think too much of yourself. And so they began to push and try to, to get Moses to back up. And they tried to get God uh, to take his hand off of Moses. Basically, they were saying, who do you think you are, preacher? And so Moses begins to preach, and he unknowingly is preaching Korah's uh, funeral because it is in that moment that the earth opens and swallows Korah and all that pertained unto Korah. However, when we go from Numbers chapter 16, it looks as if everything, again, the Bible says it, it everything that pertained to Korah was swallowed up. Bishop, his, his tent was swallowed up. His cattle were swallowed up. Everything that Korah had was swallowed up in that moment moment. However, as we began to read through Scripture, we go and we, we continue. It's 10 chapters later that Numbers chapter 26 tells us that the sons of Korah died not. Now that don't match up because 10 chapters previously it said that everything he had was gone. 10 chapters previously it said that everything pertaineth to Korah died. In that one moment that Korah backslid and rebelled against God. However, these young men, the sons of Korah, died 
not there was something that happened on that day. We don't get the picture, but what we do know is something happened on that very day that caused God to spare the sons of Korah. They disconnected themselves from the rebellion of their father. Most historians and theologians will agree that on that day, those young men held a holy rebellion against Korah and made a decision to walk away from their father. While he was slandering the man of God, they walked away. While he was saying it doesn't take all of that anymore, they walked away. While they were saying it doesn't take all that worshiping and dancing, uh, there was something inside the sons of Korah that were worshipers uh, that said, if daddy don't want to worship God, uh, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to worship God. Uh, if daddy don't want to listen to the preaching, uh, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to listen to the preaching. Uh, if daddy don't want to respond, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to respond. Uh, and I would argue today that that would be the reasoning uh, for the very first psalm that would be written that they would sing in Psalms chapter 42 and verse 1. It would be the psalm of Korah that would say, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee. Oh God, it was written by the man, the son of a descendant, the son of a man that was rebellious against God. And he said, daddy might not want truth. Mama might not want truth. My friends at church might not want truth. The man I'm sitting on the same row with uh, might not row, want truth uh, but as the deer uh, panteth after the water uh, so does my so just give me Jesus uh, they sang it about a moment ago uh, give me Jesus in the morning uh, give me Jesus in the moon day uh, give me Jesus in the midnight hour everybody might not want him but I want him uh, I want Jesus uh, more than I want my next breath uh, I want Jesus uh, more than I want food uh, in my body uh, just just give me Jesus. Hallelujah. I understand. I'm preaching right now to somebody that's grew up in the Northwest, uh, and you might not even know who Jesus is, uh, but there's that burning on the inside of you, uh, and you think you walked into this church on an accident uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Let me tell you what that was, honey. Uh, that was a song uh, from the sons of Korah that God put in you uh, that said drugs won't fill it. Uh, alcohol won't fill it. Uh, family dysfunction uh, isn't going to fix me. Uh, give me Jesus. Uh, give me Jesus. Uh, I've got to have Jesus. I can move on and preach a whole lot of stuff right here, but let me just pause for a moment and tell you, if we don't have Jesus, we don't have anything. And so if you get tired of hearing preaching about Jesus, then shame on you because that's all we have. If we don't have Jesus, we don't have nothing. Hallelujah. His sons of Korah. Issue for Korah was because of his proximity to the tabernacle. He wasn't just called to be a, wor a warrior, but he was called to be a worshiper as well. And like Korah, his sons were called to be warriors, but they understood that what good is a warrior that doesn't know how to worship? What good is a warrior that can't come into the house of God and lift his hands up and let the anointing of God get all over him? What good is a warrior that's been fighting all week but can't come into the church and say, I love you because you first loved me? <laughs> Hallelujah. God speaks through Moses. And I can tell I'm going to have to use some of this tomorrow night. <laughs> but God speaks through Moses and he says, Cor seemeth it but a small thing to you, that God, it, the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel. Think about a small thing to you, Cor. Everybody else is standing on the outside of the church, but you get to come to church. Everybody else is standing on the outside of the tent looking in, but you get to go into the places that nobody else gets to go to. Seemeth it but a small thing to you, Coram, that, where, that is the place that one of his sons begins to understand that there's more to this church stuff than it's what I do on Sunday and it's what I do on Tuesday. Cora got it all messed up and he figured that I can be a warrior all week, but I don't have to be a worshiper at the same time. 
Korah grew weary with his job. And I'm not going to read it today, but I'll give you some homework. Go home and read Numbers chapter 9 or chapter 4, and you'll see in verse 9 there's the job description that is given to Korah. Korah, the Bible says that Aaron and his sons, when they were to move the tabernacle, that the sons of Korah were to be on standby, and Aaron and his sons were to take the holy pieces of furniture and put them in purple garments and put them on a dowel rod and hang them up. And then the sons of Korah were to back into the tabernacle and they were going to pick up that dowel rod and put it on their shoulders and they were going to carry it. They didn't know what was inside of there. But little did Korah know, Korah was upset with having to come to church and and Korah was upset with having to carry the burden. But little did Korah know that what was inside of that satchel he was carrying was the anointing that the priest was going to use to sanctify the tabernacle so that when the day of atonement atonement comes around that God will turn the sins of God's people back for another year and so Korah wanted to be in the front and he wanted the anointing bottle in his hand but what Korah didn't understand is God can't trust you to get the anointing in your hand until he can trust you to put it on your shoulder and to tote it from point A to point I'm preaching to somebody right now that even in a revival church you've got frustrated with the weight of the anointing that God has for your life and you're frustrated because you don't understand why you got to carry this weight. Why can't I be like Moses? Why can't the anointing be in my hand? Why can't I be in front of everybody? But Korah, you don't understand that there was something inside of your boy that while you said, I don't want the anointing, there was a son of Korah on that day that said, Daddy, if you don't want to carry it, I'll carry it. God, help me preach this the way you gave it to me. Uh, What looked like a commoner's job uh, to Korah, what looked like the job of a slave uh, to Korah, what he did not realize uh, is under that anointing, under that satchel he was carrying around uh, was something that a young man uh, was desiring to get a hold of. Uh, Can I tell you, uh, in this season of revival, if you're not careful, uh, you'll get frustrated with your anointing, uh, and there'll be a son of Korah that'll walk in off the streets, uh, and they come out of the crack house, uh, and they come out of the bar room and while you say I don't want to carry this anointing God will raise them up to say I'll carry the anointing it doesn't matter if anybody knows who I am it doesn't matter doesn't matter if I don't get a pat on the back. God, I just want the anointing. God, I just want your power. God, I just want to be involved with what you're doing it was bare It was awkward. It was heavy. It swang back and forth as they walked. As this, and I don't have time to preach about all of these pieces of furniture, but there was something that he was carrying around that was so precious. And Corey, you don't even understand. Because once they get through breaking all of this down, you can go read it. It was their job. They were to back their way into the house of God. Nobody else out there got to got to come into the house, but the Korah, but Korah and his brethren did. And Korah got tired of walking backwards into church. Korah got tired of walking backwards and picking up the burden. Why can't I be like everybody else? Can I just tell you today that if your anointing is authentic, it's going to start just like Korah's? It's going to look like a burden. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be heavy, Brother Mayo. And when the congregation looked at it, they didn't know what was in that bag. But when the priest looked at it, congregation looked at it and all it looked like to them was a burden. But when the priest looked at it, he saw what was underneath that, uh, underneath that purple satchel. And while everybody said, oh, poor Korah, he's having to carry all of that stuff. There was something inside of the Levite uh, that were looking at him and saying, boys, you don't even understand what he's carrying around. We can't do what we do if he doesn't do what he's doing right now. Can I, can I just preach to somebody right now that feels insignificant and feels like you don't matter in the church uh, and you've been carrying around this burden uh, and and the devil's trying to convince you to throw it down. Can I tell you that the priest can't do what he does if you don't do what you're called to do? 
He can get up here and scream and do the whirly bird and jump up and down uh, and run in circles all he wants to. Uh, but if there's not a saint of God that'll get up under the burden uh, of the anointing of God and put it on their shoulders. Uh, if there's not somebody, I know I'm where I'm at today. Uh, I'm preaching to where we're going. Uh, if there's not somebody that'll make up in their mind, uh, I'm going to follow the man of God. Uh, and if he lays down that anointing, uh, it's my job to pick it up and carry it uh, so that he can do what he's called to do. Uh, when we get into the house of God, I just want to be a part of what God's doing. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why Cora walked away. Cora got mad. But the son of Cora said, nope, not me. I am not walking away. There was a son of Korah that said, it's, it's heavy, but I'll carry it. There was a son of Korah that said, it's 530 prayer meeting, and that means i got to get up an extra 30 minutes earlier before I go to work, but it'll be all right. I'm more worried about carrying the anointing than I am anything else. And there, there was somebody that said, Pastor, I know, I know you really don't know what I'm going through right now, and when you call me and tell me you want me to be at the church and do this and this and this, and you've got a list of jobs for me to do, and you don't know that I can't barely even get peace in my mind, and I'm depressed. Pressed, uh, and I'm full of anxiety, uh, but I'm not quitting the church. Uh, I'm not quitting my job. Uh, I've got a job to carry the anointing, uh, and it doesn't matter what I've got to do. I'm not laying it down. Uh, I'm not walking away. Cora said it's too much, but we know the spirit of his sons, for they would write in Psalms 84 and verse 10, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. That was the song of the son of Korah that said, Daddy, you can do what you wanted to, but as for me, I'm staying with the church. As for me, I'm staying with the preacher. As for me, I'm staying with God. If you could only understand how important it is for you to be a worshiper and a warrior. If you could only understand how important it is for you to carry that anointing. If you could only understand how important it is for you to walk into the house of God and get a hold of it. Because I'm going to tell you, you're not going to fill this church up and build another one until somebody makes up in their mind, I'm going to be like the sons of Korah and not Korah himself. While everybody else wants to walk away, I'm going to be that one that's in the house of God. You can't run me off. You can't offend me. You can't kick me out of the church. You can't do anything to make me leave this. I've got a... I would rather spend one day in here than a thousands in the tents of wickedness. I'd rather sit right here than be with Korah and be consumed. Just let me, just let me carry the anointing. Korah's problem is he wanted to be like Moses. Korah never wanted to carry the anointing. He wanted to control the anointing. He watched as Moses anointed Aaron and he wanted to be the man in control. He watched as, anoint, as Moses anointed the elders. And he wanted to be the guy that was in a control. But Korah, if you could just only know that one day, there's going to come a day that it's not going to be in the hands of Moses anymore. But there's going to be a day that a man by the name of Samuel is going to get an anointing in his hands. Because he learned how to do the work in the house of God just by sweeping up behind Eli. There's going to come a day that we can see First Chronicles chapter 6. Go read it. You'll find out I'm telling you the truth. That this man, Samuel, the anointed prophet of God, was going to be a man that would anoint the first king and the second king of Israel. He was going to stand before all the people. And First Chronicles chapter 6, you can see he's a descendant of the sons of Korah. What Korah didn't realize is it might not start with you. The anointing might not be in your hands. But if you'll continue you to be a worshiper while you're a warrior there's going to be the day that your great grandkids are going to stand in the house of God and they're going to and they're going to use that anointing all and it's not going to be on their shoulders but it's going to be on their hand come on I'm preaching to somebody right now you, you, you want to be used by God then keep on doing what you're doing you may never get behind this pulpit and preach you may never be called to the front to take the anointing all and lay it on somebody's head but can I tell you 
your grandson uh, may start a daughter work out of this church. Uh, your grandson uh, might become a missionary. Uh, your grandson might be an event. You might not be anything to everybody uh, to tell anybody else, uh, but you're something to God, uh, and you're making Moses do what he can do uh, if you just keep on walking uh, and keep on carrying the anointing. I want to do it to somebody that wanted it so bad that they picked it up in obscurity. He said, I'm going to do it through somebody that wanted it so bad. I'm going to use Samuel because the sons of Korah, we don't have hardly any names of the descendants of Korah. We got Samuel. There's a few more that I don't have time to read, and we can talk about that in a Bible study, but I don't have time to give you a Bible study today. We don't have a whole lot of names of the sons of Korah. They were nameless. They were men that nobody knew about, but they were doing the job. They were coming to church. They were making sure that when the priest got in the pulpit, that everything was set in order so that he wouldn't happen to fight giants off of his back so he could fight the giant in front of him. If you're not careful, we'll let this season of revival that we're in, I don't know, and I'll, I'll explain some of this later, but I don't know why it's this church. I told Pastor Mayo this the other day. I was texting him. I said, I don't know why it's this church, but there's something about this church that God has chosen to be the launching place of dominion in the Northwest. And that's why why I'm preaching to you right now is so important because as he leads this church, somebody's got to watch his back. As he gets in the pulpit and preaches what thus saith the Lord of how we move forward, there's got to be a son of Korah that says, I don't care if I ever get my name called. I'm going to go to the church and I'm going to lay on the floor and I'm going to travail and I'm going to pray and I'm going to make sure that God knows that the devil's not going to get his teeth into the back of my pastor. Aaron's going to be able to walk to the pulpit and do his job because I'm a son of Korah and I might be nameless but I'm powerful nobody might not know who I am but I'm powerful I may never get in the pulpit but I'm powerful when I recognize who I am and I walk in the anointing that God has given me you obtain the anointing that your father rejected you obtain the anointing that your, your grandpa said he didn't want and God said, Korah, if you could only get it, you're f famous in the congregation. You, you're, a man of you're a man of renown, but you don't understand how important it is what you're doing. See, and there's another piece of this, this job that, that Korah had. Is his. It wasn't just to carry that anointing, but there was an altar, the brazen altar. And this is important. You remember this. When they packed up the brazen altar, when God constructed it, he said, you put rings in the side of it. And the purpose of that is they're going to run dowel rods through that, Pastor Mayo. And there's going to be somebody from the Levites that's going to pick that up and they're going to put it on their shoulders and they're going to carry this altar of sacrifice. You know whose job that was? Any guesses? It was Korah's job. And he said, when you move it, you take it and you cover it with a piece of leather garment. Purple, purple badger skin and you cover it and you take it from point A to point B and I can just see Cor getting mad why do I got to carry this why can't I carry that gold box like Aaron gets to carry this ain't in here as pretty as that that, that box is a box of beauty nobody covers it up nobody covers up the, up the box that Aaron's carrying, but here I am. And can you imagine? Now, let, let's just be honest. This was a place that they brought animals and laid it and sacrificed. Have you ever smelled burnt hair? That don't smell good. The guts and the blood that had been sprinkled. I don't know what the cleaning process was, but I'm pretty sure there was caked blood on this altar. But yet again, Cora, if you don't carry the the burden of sacrifice. When Aaron goes into the Holy of Holies and sprinkles the blood upon the altar, it ain't going to work because you can't get into the Holy of Holies 
without going past that altar of sacrifice. You want the mercy of God? You want the wrath of God to be turned back? You want the Shekinah glory to come in and fill the house? That only happens when Aaron can do his job, and Aaron can't do it if Korah is not picking up that burden of sacrifice and saying, I'm not, I am willing to do whatever it takes to have revival. It doesn't matter what it costs me. If it costs me my money, I'm giving it. If it costs me my life, I'm giving it. If it costs me, I don't care what it costs. Revival is the most important thing in my world. And I'm telling you, when you make the revival the most important thing in your world, and you make breakthrough the most important thing in your world, God will add the money, and God will add the family, and God will add all this stuff. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be added unto you. But Korah couldn't get that through his thick skull because he didn't understand that what I'm carrying is so important. And Korah, you, you don't even get it. You don't even get it. What you're carrying around is literally a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ himself because there will be a day that they are going to rip a purple garment off of him and they're going to cast lots. They're going to pull the garment off just like you watch the garment get pulled off the altar of sacrifice. They're going to pull off that same purple garment and there's going to be revealed underneath. It's going to be the sacrifice for all sins. Corey, you don't even realize what you're carrying around you just think it's a box, but hidden under that garment, uh, hidden under that leather uh, is a type and a shadow of Christ himself. And you think it's unimportant uh, because it's a burden of sacrifice. Uh, but Cora, I'm going to change the world uh, with what you're carrying around. Uh, Cora, I'm going to change humanity uh, with what you're carrying around. Uh, if you can just realize uh, that there's a power uh, in what you're carrying. I don't know how that applies to me. Let me tell you something. When you carry around that altar of sacrifice, you are quite literally doing the same thing that the sons of Korah were doing. You are carrying around Jesus Christ himself, and Jesus Christ changed the world. And when you put that burden of sacrifice on your shoulder, all of Spokane can feel it when you walk into the supermarket. All of Spokane can feel it when you walk when you walk down the street street knocking on doors. You're not just walking by yourself, but you're carrying around a sacrifice. You're carrying around Jesus Christ himself. You're carrying around the Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you're going to change this city, if you're going to change the Northwest, it's going to be because somebody gets under the burden of sacrifice. The ark of the covenant is powerless if there's no ark of sacrifice. Sin can't be turned back from the northwest if there's not somebody that makes up in their mind today. It's all or it's nothing. I'm going to preach part two of this again at a later time, probably tomorrow night. But right now, I just want you to understand, I want to drive this home. You, you, you find out it's in your Bible. 30,000 men can be lost in one battle because the Ark of the Covenant didn't have the right power because Hophni and Phinehas had not been doing right by the altar of sacrifice. 30,000 men died when they brought it into the battle, Sister Mayo, and they shouted and they danced and they believed God for victory. They were in Ebenezer, and the Philistines were in, were in Aphek, and they came together, and they fought, and 30,000 men died. Not because the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there, but because it was powerless. Because when Hophni and Phinehas were supposed to be at the altar of sacrifice doing the work of God, they were doing their own will. Instead of being 
sensitive to the Spirit. Say, why are you preaching like this on the first day of revival? You're supposed to come in and shout us and dance us and make us run the aisles and make us swing from the chandelier. Honey, I've been doing this long enough to know what I'm supposed to do. I know how to push every button there is in Pentecost, but I didn't come here to push buttons and pull rabbits out of hats. I came here to help this church. I've been praying. I've been fasting. I've been believing God, and I know you have too, and what I'm trying to do right now is shake this church to a realization we're not going where we're supposed to go if we've only got 5% of us on board. We're not going and where we're supposed to go if we've only got 20% of us, of us uh, on board. Uh, what we need uh, is a revival right now on a Sunday afternoon uh, of somebody that'll crawl up under the burden uh, and say revival in the Northwest is my personal mission. Uh, it's not the mission of my pastor. Uh, it's not the mission, it's not the mission uh, of the music team. Uh, it's not the mission uh, of the ministry team. Uh, it is my personal mission uh, and I'm going to sing the song of the sons of Korah that say whatever it takes I just want to be involved Aaron's job is going to become obsolete but we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Heron's job passed away at the moment that the purple garment was ripped away from Jesus and he was put on the cross. For we now have a high priest who's tempted in his all points as we are tempted yet without sin. So I'm not going to need Aaron to go behind the veil. But I tell you what I do need. I need somebody that knows how to worship. I need somebody that will make it up in their mind. I want revival more than anything else in the world. The musicians are getting ready to come on this Sunday afternoon. My question is, is there anybody here that's tired of singing your own songs? He said, you know why? And, the, the, and, and I'm, I'm trying to close, but you know why they sang, oh, clap your hands, all ye people, Sister Mayo, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph and do it with understanding? They clapped their hands and they shouted because they realized they weren't even supposed to be there. When they wrote that verse, I don't know, if, I, I don't know what it was like. I, I really don't. Some say it was Hezekiah that wrote it for these men and that plays in, in the same deal. But it's clapping and it's shouting. But they say, when you do this, you do it with the understanding that you're not even supposed to be here. When you clap your hands, my prayer today is that you never put your hands together and shout without thinking about this sermon and think about the fact that God could have let you die with your in the same way that he let your daddy die. God could have let you die an addict the way he let your mama die an addict. God could have let you end up in the same crack house that your brother's still sitting in right now. But you clap your hands and you shout unto God with a voice of triumph because you understand I got the anointing that my daddy didn't want. I picked up the burdens that my daddy didn't want. Daddy didn't won't sacrifice, but I'm just glad to be here. Daddy didn't want prayer, but I'm just glad to be here. Daddy didn't want to go to church and give his all, but I'm here to clap my hands and I'm here to shout because I realize God didn't have to save me. Clap your hands with understanding. that when God was handing out anointing, brother, brother Marks, he could have passed me by. When God was giving out jobs in the church, he could have let the world swallow me up quite literally. We could preach that is that you could have backslid. You could have walked away from God. You had a decision, and you, you, you decided to stay with the church. And when God said, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph, he's literally trying to get you to understand uh, the world could have swallowed you up. Uh, you don't, you're not supposed to be here. But God, 
who is rich in mercy. <laughs> I looked at family. Society looked at your family and said, he'll end up just like his daddy. She'll end up just like her mama. Society looked at your family and they won't ever be anything but God who is rich in mercy. I don't know what it is about God. I don't know if it's his poetic nature, but there's just something about him that knows how to get greatness out of the gutters. I don't know what it is about him. You said it a few moments ago that's attracted to this little redneck from Mississippi. I don't know what it is about him that will use me. But God, I just want to sing the songs of the sons of Korah today. And when I clap my hands, I just want you to know I'm just glad to be here. You don't have to use me. You don't have to call my name. You, you, you don't... Even if you don't even bless me. I know that's where, that's where some of y'all draw, draw the line because we're so caught up in 2023 in favor over my life and favor over my kids and favor over my money. And I believe in the favor of God and I walk in the favor of God. But I'm going to tell you something right now. you got to have a walk with God when favor runs out that understand I'm just glad to be here. Just glad. When I consider the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars, what is man? Oh, that you are mindful of us, son of man, that thou hast visited him. You know what David was saying is, hey, honey, I ain't nothing. I'm just glad to be in the church. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you when the devil jumps on your shoulder and tells you you're so unimportant. And that depression comes and tries to sit on your shoulder and tell you you can't make a difference. I want you to turn. Open up your Bible. You're right, devil. I, I'm not much, but I'm in the church. You're right. I don't belong here, but I'm here anyway. I'm not just clapping for the announcements. I'm not just clapping to clap. I'm clapping with an understanding that he saved me. I'm clapping with an understanding that he found me. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. He looked beyond what I was and saw what I could be. I'm just glad to be in the church. I'm done. I want you to, today, if you're going to make a conscious decision to bear the burden of sacrifice, and to carry this anointing throughout this revival. If you're not going to help us, you stay where you're at. I don't want anybody lying and getting struck by God. But if you're going to make a conscious decision today in this revival to get up under the anointing and to get up under that burden of sacrifice, I want you to make your way from where you are right now. Fill this altar. Come on, fill this altar. Pastor Mayo, there, there's, there's revival. There's a harvest. But we got to get this right first. Come on. Come on, make your way from where you are. If you're making a decision today, say, Preacher, I don't really know what that means. Well, I'm going to tell you what you do. You find one of these elders and you ask them. You, we can give you Bible studies of what it means to be anointed and what it means to walk it with God and to walk with sacrifice. Now, while you're standing where you are, this is a conscious decision. We're not just doing this to do it. I want you to, if you're, if you're willing, I want you to praise God by clapping your hands and shouting. But I want you to do it with an understanding. I'm just here. I, I'm just glad to be here. 
Come on, they're going to get ready to sing. But I want you to go beyond your little 30-second hand clap and your little I love you, Jesus, and let your hand clap right now be a declaration that I want God more than I want anything else in the world. Come on. Oh, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on, there's something happening in this house right now. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with understanding. Come on, somebody press in. There's some of you here right now. You ain't got to the place that you're at right now in six months. Come on, the devil's trying to convince you to give up and to throw in the towel and to quit church, but you're here. Come on, come on, come on, press in. It's your hour to press in. Come on, that's it. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Worship for 